All right, it is noon. Welcome back to the forestry lunch break series on forest insects. I'm Patrick Schultz. Um, it is day three and we are talking today about uh, wood boring and stem infesting insects again with uh, Glenn Kohler. Glenn, how you doing? Good. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the usual logistics, please make sure that your chat box is set to everybody. Um, and of course, this is being recorded and I hope you are um, enjoying those recordings. Uh, if you are having to skip out for the Q&A, uh, those will be available on this website in perpetuity. So anytime you wanna come back to this information, uh, you're of course more than welcome to. And that can be very useful because we're covering a lot this week. So I will stop sharing, turn things over to you, Glenn, and let you get after it. Okay, sounds good. Uh, looks like I'm disabled on the sharing. Ah, this is uh, amateur hour. Keep forgetting. Hey, four, ti four times in a row. Yeah. <laughs> it's challenging. Okay, let me know if you see these. Looks good. All right, let's make them bigger. Maybe. There we go. Okay, Perfect. good afternoon. Uh, my name is Glenn Kohler. I'm a forest entomologist with Washington Department of Natural Resources uh, out of Olympia, cover the whole state of Washington, uh, provide technical assistance to state private landowners. Uh, and do some insect monitoring statewide. So uh, that's my quick intro. If you weren't here for one of the last two days, this is day three, uh, and I'll be focusing on wood borers uh, and a couple of other stem infesting insects <clears throat> that are important in Western Washington. Uh, most of this stuff I'm gonna talk about today is actually important on, on both sides of the state, uh, except one thing at the end. Um, so this will be a nice little break from the uh, kind of death and destruction of bark beetles. Uh, these insects tend to be more uh, sec what we call secondary uh, or going after trees that are already injured or stressed by something else. Um, and a, a favorite group of mine, um, these beetles uh, in two different families uh, one example here, the ponderous borer uh, is in the cerambicid family or longhorn beetles, uh, round-headed wood borer. They have a lot of different common names, and that may be because they're, they're super noticeable uh, when you're out in the woods, especially after a fire um, or any area where there's a lot of recently killed trees. Uh, the larvae of these beetles are feeding in that dead wood. Uh, and this beetle, the ponderous borer, is incidentally the the largest beetle that you can find in the state of Washington. Uh, and sometimes people see these, they have these uh, leathery wing covers are kind of soft. Uh, some people actually think they're like flying cockroaches, which is can be kind of frightening. Um, and then you have an, the other family, the flat-headed borers uh, or metallic wood borers in the, in the buprested family. And they look the adults look quite a bit different. I'll get into how to tell them apart uh, later, but generally they're performing the same role in the woods. Uh, and, then, and then we have an oddball here, a moth, uh, the larvae of a moth feeding in uh, under the bark of this pine tree and causing a lot of uh, pitch flow over several years. Okay, so generally wood borers, you know, we talked about bark beetles the last couple of days. If you get in under the bark and uh, a recently killed tree and you're trying to identify uh, bark beetles or whatever may have killed that tree, you can tell these apart mainly because um, of the shape of the, of the tunneling. And so with the wood borers on the left, you get this random wandering, uh, there's no real pattern to it. Uh, the larvae are much larger. So they're gonna be, you know, over, quarter inch size. Um, the exit holes, uh, you'll see them come out through the bark when the new adults emerge, but also you'll see these holes in the wood itself, like this example here. 
uh, they're either going to be perfectly round like that with the longhorn wood bore here or a oval shape um, with the metallic wood bores. Bark beetles, on the other hand, their galleries, you know, tend to be in straighter lines or parallel and the larvae are much smaller, less than a quarter inch rice size uh, and C shaped. Okay, not not really worm like. Um, and they do, you know, I'll just point out they both exist in that same layer, especially these uh, the metallic wood borers like to feed in the inner bark where the bark beetles are also feeding. Um, look for tunnels in the sapwood. You know, you've all seen this in firewood because uh, usually that's taken from dead trees and they're filled with these, these beetle larvae. Um, the frass uh, or boring dust on the outside of trees with the bark beetles, uh, it's always going to be kind of a pure brown uh, powder, like the brown powder here. Uh, but notice this is mixed with some white wood shavings. Uh, anytime you see white uh, wood shavings or white powder, uh, that indicates there's something feeding in the in the sapwood, and it's either wood borers or uh, ambrosia beetles that I talked about on Monday. The the galleries, you know, I already mentioned this kind of random wandering pattern. Um, but another thing to look for with wood borers is the tunneling that you're seeing in the inner bark. There's no adults moving through here with wood borers like the bark beetles. They go in and lay eggs in this layer. Uh, the wood boring adults uh, chew little holes on the outside of the bark and then the larvae tunnel in themselves. And so this is made by a wood borer larva. And notice that the tunnel just keeps getting slightly wider. Uh, as this larva feeds along here, um, and so they're they're growing, so getting wider. Whereas with bark beetles, this is kind of an oddball bark beetle, the western pine beetle, um, not in western Washington, uh, but just an example of how these tunnels, while the same pattern, uh, they are not getting wider because these are made by adult bark beetles, which aren't growing. At that point, they're done. Uh, so just to point out that difference. Um, okay, so what what are they doing? The you know I mentioned they like dead and dying trees, and they're going to locate those in the same way that bark beetles do by following the volatiles coming off the alcohol and and terpenes coming off of these dead and dying or stressed trees. They find those. The adults will chew, uh, like I said, a little hole into the bark. Uh, sometimes called an oviposition pit, uh, and, and will lay eggs in there, and then the larvae uh, mine in under the bark. Um, and then the, initially they're feeding in this inner bark layer, the phloem, uh, where the sugars are, where the bark beetles are. And then as they get bigger, eventually they will dive into the sapwood itself and start feeding in there. And that's where you get these, these white shavings going. Uh, they're really important ecologically. Um, and this is their main role is as kind of the cleanup crew. So not only are they creating these holes in the sapwood, they're carrying decay fungi with them that they picked up uh, in the trees they were they were born in um, and move that stuff from tree to tree. And so if, if it weren't for the wood borers, um, the decay process would probably take a lot longer. Uh, because they're tunneling deeper into the tree and those fungi then get access to to more central parts of the tree and then of course uh, a lot of wildlife benefits from this because these wood bore are the uh, woodpeckers um, not only can they feed on the young larvae of bark beetles and wood borers in the in the bark inner bark layer uh, but then they can start to go past that as they're excavating cavity nests. Um, the wood boring activity and the decay fungi heart rot will make it a lot easier for them to get in under uh, and make these cavities. Um, and of course, you, you can imagine if you're a woodpecker and you're you're making holes this big, you're getting a few wood borer larvae as you're going going along there. Um, I toyed with the idea of calling this series insects for lunch. Um, but maybe that's not very appealing <laughs> to me, me not included. Um, but hey, you know, if you're stranded in the woods and you have a tool and dig into some trees, this is probably a good food source. Okay, so 
what why are they important besides ecology to you know what we're doing um i mentioned this they're secondary okay so really not having a major impact as far as forest management goes uh they're really common coming into trees that were killed by bark beetles uh in root rot areas uh wildfire that's a great place to find these um if you've ever been to a recent burn uh the the following spring or summer a uh, nice quiet hike uh, through a burned forest you can literally hear these insects chewing under the bark it's kind of like echoing around uh if it's quiet enough it's it's really crazy um and then of course trees that are stressed by drought so they're secondary to all of that there are a couple species uh one in particular the flat-headed fur borer that's a common name uh same as kind of the, the whole family um that can aggressively kill trees acting a little bit more like a bark beetle on dry or droughty uh, sites or droughty years so I'll, I'll talk more about that one in detail there are several species that can cause economic damage to wood products um so you can imagine there you know if there's enough tunnels that can compromise the structural integrity uh and also people less likely to pick up the wood at the at the home depot um boring uh in the sapwood or heartwood can speed decay um as i mentioned that's a good thing to get nutrient cycling back into the woods but if you've got a tree next to a house uh or in a campground or something that's that's died uh it's going to become a hazard to falling much more quickly because of the activity of these you know tunneling and decay fungi brought in by these beetles um and then we have uh an interesting uh a life cycle with these you know the bark beetles we talked about one to two generations a year kind of typical for bark beetles these some of these wood borers can go like four years from egg to adult and so they're sitting in the wood of a tree in the forest for that long um but when we get that wood into buildings if if it's untreated wood uh it was sitting in the forest with the bark on uh allowing these wood borers to get going in there um you put it in you know the picture here is maybe too zoomed in but it's it's a log cabin these are two round logs you know you can see the seam uh in between the logs that that's pretty dry wood right there's very little moisture in there and so it just takes the larvae that much longer to to grow into adults and literally could take 50 years uh for, for them to come out and it's it's pretty mind-blowing to me that they can continue to survive that long on such a such little food resource um but basically what ends up happening is uh you get you get a little surprise at some point uh these beetle adults start boring out of the woodwork and if you've got drywall over that or anything they'll drill right through it um and you can see a see an oval shaped exit hole here from a from a buprested coming out of there and and i've i've gotten reports of this in like furniture that's been made out of uh you know sort of natural wood tables and that sort of thing so watch out for that one if you're milling your own wood um it's they're not going to reinfest anything in the cabin like termites or ants uh because they lay you know the adults don't feed on wood and they want to lay eggs on a freshly killed tree they're not going to do anything with a seasoned seasoned wood uh so if you're using you know building stuff out of stuff you you've milled or taken uh from your own property remove the bark uh, as soon as possible get it milled as soon as possible it doesn't necessarily have to be pressure treated or anything you just want to keep them from getting in there uh, in the first place um the wood borers have provided some inspiration for uh technology we use in the woods uh the person that started the oregon chainsaw company um the story goes that you know the old school chainsaws there's the the two-man version here uh they weren't very efficient uh at you know they might get clogged up with sawdust and um the story goes that he was observing these wood borers uh their mouth parts uh kind of this sickle shaped 
uh, and they would chew alternating back and forth right to left and efficiently moving the wood chips out behind them. Uh, and so that's where this, this design of the alternating chisels on a chain uh, came from, was inspired by the, the, these wood borers. You know, nature is pretty good at working out ways to, to move wood. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so three major families to identify these things. Um, I kind of got into this a little bit in the beginning. So the Bufrested family, uh, flat-headed wood borers, um, and they get that name because, uh, I have better pictures of this, but essentially the head here on the larva is wider uh, than the rest of the body. Um, and also when they adults emerge, they leave a kind of more flattened hole, like an oval or D-shaped hole, uh, also known as metallic wood borers because a lot of the species have this shiny uh, green or bronze uh, kind of metallic sheen to them, really cool looking looking beetles. Um, then we have the Cerambicid family, the longhorned beetles uh, or round headed. And that's a similar uh, name. The, the head is more uh, rounded and about the same width as the, the larvae's body and they make a round exit hole. Uh, and the longhorn, of course, is referring to these huge uh, antennae. So my personal favorite insect group right there. Um, the longhorn beetles. Then we have the uh, little bit scarier uh, Cerisid family known as horn tails uh, or wood wasps. They also have larvae very similar to the other two that that bore in uh, sapwood, but not a beetle. And this horn tail here uh, is kind of a gnarly looking stinger um, that is actually for laying eggs. Uh, it's an ovipositor. They use it to drill down under the bark. Um, but I have heard stories uh, from loggers, uh, people who, you know, all their clothes and their boots smell like dead trees, right? So the, <laughs> these insects are attracted to you uh, if you're smelling like a dead tree. And uh, these wood wasps will uh, apparently try to drill in uh, through your boot, <laughs> which sounds kind of could be painful if you weren't paying attention. Uh, all right, so round-headed wood borer. Um, the exit hole is usually kind of clean cut, perfectly round. Uh, that's just the cross section of the adult. And then again, the, the head is slightly wider than the body. Uh, the boring material or frass that they make usually contains some white shavings um, and or chips, you know, and then the antennae are usually much longer than the body on the adults. Uh, and that's really cool. You can see that even in the pupa, you know, you got to tuck that little antenna there. It's curled up nice and neat, uh, ready for emergence later. Uh, and here's some examples. This is an incredibly diverse group. Um, you know, if you're a beetle collector, uh, wow, is there some some awesome stuff here. Um, you know, you got a metallic blue one that that we've seen in cedar trees. Um, these Sawyer beetles are super, super common. Um, and you get some really colorful ones in hardwoods, like the locust borer. This one, as far as I know, has the longest antennae uh, of any of them. And that that's one that comes out of ponderosa pines. And then you got a weird one here that's uh, the wing covers uh, are actually shortened. And so you can see the um, kind of smoky clear wings underneath that normally most of these other beetles you, those are covered up um pretty pretty cool looking uh, kind of you know bumblebee mimic in a way uh i think might scare off some predators all right so this the other group the flat-headed uh wood borers here's kind of an extreme example of the wide head on the larva uh you know kind of like a horseshoe nail and uh, their, their boring pattern is a little bit different. You get the, the more oval shaped holes because their bodies are more flattened uh, oval exit hole for the adults. And the body on these you can see is kind of torpedo shaped or football shaped. Uh, antennae are really short. And uh, I mentioned the metallic sheen. So they're, they're pretty distinctive. Um, and then they're, they're tunneling. Uh, the, the boring dust or frass, you don't see as many of the white chips in here 
or shavings. Uh, it's more like this, this brown uh, sawdust and it makes these concentric arches uh, or crescent shapes that are just layered on here as they're packing the frass in uh, when they chew. Some examples of, of those, and again, these are all natives, um, mostly, you know, kind of good guys in the cleanup crew, but there's a couple here. Um, the, the bronze birch borer is a, a problem pest with birch trees, especially when they're in dry areas or stressed birch trees. Uh, the flat-headed fir borer is the one that can actually kill uh, fir trees on droughty, dry sites. Um, and then we have the western cedar borer, uh, which can get in actually live cedar. Um, sometimes you'll see it tunneling in branches or in the heartwood of, of cedar trees that are that are still alive, um, but it can really impact the, the wood quality uh, with the holes at some point. Uh, okay, so this is the only one I'm really going to focus on uh, more specifically, the Phenops tremondi. Uh, is the, the flat-headed fur borer. So in Southwest Oregon, so down like the Medford area, this has always been a real problem in, uh, with dug fur on these super dry sites down there. And it's behaving a lot more like a bark beetle, um, beating in that phloem layer in the inner bark and cutting off the flow of sugars. So uh, killing the tree without the aid of bark beetles and uh, the adults are, are small so this this one is like less than three quarter inch in size the hosts are dug fur and grand fur for the most part um, it's really hard to see signs of attack on the outside of the bark you don't get the the piles of red boring dust or or pitch streams as you do with bark beetles uh, you might see some some top kill uh, related to these, and this can be really easily confused with the secondary bark beetles that that we talked about the last couple of days, um, dug for pole beetle and dug for engraver. Uh, and this this is actually sometimes they're called firebugs, um, and that's because again you get a burned area, they're really attracted to that stuff and laying eggs in those fire killed trees as long as they're not totally cooked. Um, and so again, another, you know, working in the woods stories is firefighters will, of course, you know, they smell like burnt trees. Um, and these insects are really annoying because they'll actually come in immediately after a fire. Some of them have, um, have an infrared sensor system so they can literally detect heat uh, and, and get into a fire area immediately after the burn. Um, and so then they're crawling up under uh, firefighters' clothes and, and biting them, um, thinking they're, they're trees to lay eggs on. So sounds, sounds pretty horrible. Um, so yeah, that's a fire bug. And one thing I'm, I'm concerned about with this one, with climate change and uh, increased drought intensity, is that we're going to start, I've seen a few examples of this in Washington, where this was the only thing uh, in a green dug for that was dying uh, were these beetles. Um, and so we might start to see more issues with this in, in Washington on the drier sites. Okay, and the third big uh, wood tunneling, wood boring is, is the horn tails. Uh, I already mentioned this, you know, how this, you got the uh, female here and the much smaller male uh, that doesn't have the, the ovipositor, um, Actually, you know, I might be wrong. I just pulled this photo off yesterday. That might be just a smaller female, a different species. Uh, usually the male doesn't have this uh, stinger looking ovipositor, but you can see how large that is. Um, anyway, it, they, they're a primitive wasp. And so they don't have that thin waist that you see like on the yellow jackets and bees. It's, it's really broad across here um, from the thorax to the abdomen. And similar, you know, boring pattern to the other two beetle families, um, but they go straight into the sapwood. They don't bother in the in the phloem uh, inner bark layer. Uh, and the larvae, uh, so here's the head, have this uh, sharp spine on the rear end, which is obviously related to the growth of this uh, ovipositor. Um, the the other beetles, the beetles do not have that. So, uh, and there is a 
There is a non-native uh, wood wasp that's an issue in, in eastern North America called Cyrex um, that we're, we're on the lookout for uh, coming over to the west coast but have not detected that yet. Um, so all this talk about exit holes, you know, round versus oval and uh, th these uh, holes that sapsuckers or kind of woodpecker make can look really similar um, to those exit holes in size and shape. And, and so sometimes I get questions, people aren't familiar with this, this bird or these birds, um, might think that these are, are wood borers or bark beetles coming out of the trees. And um, the way to know the difference here, it might be obvious from these photos is the, the woodpecker holes are very shallow. Uh, they don't go all the way in deep uh, into the sapwood as a wood borer would, uh, and they're in neat little rows. So either horizontal or vertical rows. Um, and so the woodpecker is just using that to uh, feed on the sap or attract, uh, eat insects that are attracted to the sap. So pretty harmless. However, when you get to this stage uh, on the left here, the bark starts to um, not function as well. And uh, a smaller diameter tree could actually end up dying from this. <clears throat> Uh, we do have some exotic wood boring beetles of concern. Uh, this emerald ash borer on the upper right there has actually just been detected in Oregon um, in Forest Grove near Portland last year, unfortunately. Um, so that's on the horizon for Washington. It's very, very difficult to eradicate emerald ash borer. Uh, once it gets into an area and uh, so the spread of that you know started in Michigan um, in the 2000s and it's been pretty relentlessly moving out uh, over the years and I'll talk more in detail about that issue tomorrow on the invasives um, and there's a couple longhorned wood borer species there that we've, we've actually had some introductions of in Washington uh, like around warehouses and nurseries uh, where they've come in on on woodpacking material or in live trees. Uh, fortunately, those were early detected and and dealt with. Um, but you'll notice that some of our native species that I've been talking about uh, are can be very similar in shape and color. And, uh, so, you know, it's easy for people like yourselves to notice these things and report. In fact, the emerald ash borer in Oregon was reported by a, you know. A, a quote unquote regular person, uh, even though I think they had some some good tree or entomology background. Um, but so they're easy to recognize, right? They're big enough to see. And uh, so we in really encourage people to report sightings, uh, anything, even if it's a native, uh, it doesn't hurt anybody to, to report. So get photos, get specimens, uh, and you can report those to the, the Washington Invasive Species Council. Um, or just you know googling like report invasive insect it usually gets you to the right place. So we we appreciate that. Um, okay, so moving back away from all these really interesting beetles and wasps that live in the wood to um, some of these things that might be actually more pests uh, than beneficial. This this group uh, uh, pitch moths, a uh, couple species here are. You think you're looking at a yellow jacket there, <laughs> um, but in fact that is a moth, and it has clear wings without the you know uh, opaque scales that you have on most moths. So that's mimicry to prevent predators probably from eating it. Um, so they they lay eggs on especially prefer uh, like pruning wounds or broken branch uh, anywhere where it's easy for them to get under the bark. And there's a little uh, caterpillar that lives just under the bark there, feeding on the, the phloem and sap coming out of this tree and somehow, you know, surviving to become an adult moth without getting all gummed up in pitch. I don't know how that works. Um, but then they, they fly out as adults and after mating, the female moths will actually return uh, to the same a wounded area, pitch area, and lay another egg in there. And so you get these multiple generations of larvae feeding in the same spot. So that's why these 
these pitch globs can get really huge uh, and then they're dripping pitch everywhere and there are places where this is you know you got this is a tree in the, my building's parking lot in Olympia and um, people park near that they're going to get pitched all over the car uh, so if you want to avoid this you know it can cause uh, issues in smaller diameter trees where they might break um, but this isn't really a tree killer uh, it's just a tree stressor so if you want to avoid this uh, don't be pruning in the spring uh, at the time when these insects and others are flying and attracted to that that pruning smell and it's also better for trees to to prune closer to the fall uh, when they're going dormant anyway uh, okay and on, on the coast um, you know you have a lot of sitka spruce and and some people have planted sitka spruce uh, further away from the coast in sort of hotter drier areas that don't get a lot of fog and uh, may not may will be having issues with this weevil um, that is super damaging I mean it's probably the worst pest uh, of sitka spruce in Washington and it's it's a little cute little weevil, uh, you know, and behaves kind of like a bark beetle, uh, but has this big long nose at the front. Uh, lays eggs under the bark, uh, and the larvae are feeding uh, just under the bark layer and in the wood uh, a little bit. And um, they make these chip cocoons, which have some wood shaving around them before they turn into adults. And essentially, what that's doing, they really like the leader of the spruce tree and so that's essentially just killing the top of your your spruce tree and then you know you get another side branch that takes over as a new leader and it won't kill the tree uh, but it basically creates this bush uh, that never really grows tall and the weevils keep coming back year after year and keep hitting the leader so they really like fast growing leaders uh, so you know that that growth that you get in a single year or the previous year, you know, if that's over a foot long, uh, that's what they love. And the shorter, slower growing trees, the females don't like to lay eggs in those um, for reasons I won't get into, but that's why as you get closer to the beach uh, or in, in the river valleys where there's more fog regularly, the spruce don't grow very fast because they're not getting a lot of sun. Uh, and so you don't see as much issue with this in Sitka spruce's kind of natural uh, habitat. Um, and so if you want to manage this thing or concerned about it, you know, if, you, if you're planting Sitka spruce further away from the coast, uh, where you're going to get that fast growth, um, you might want to consider planting something else, um, you know, that's not a host. It's uh, like Doug fir, hemlock, et cetera, cedar. Um, but you could plant densely, delay your thinning. Uh, there are some people that will plant an alder uh, hardwood overstory. The alder grows faster and that shades the spruce. And then eventually you get to the point where the trees are old enough, uh, 35 feet tall, uh, that weevils don't really like them anymore because those leaders aren't, aren't as juicy. Um, and eventually they grow out of this, but, uh, and so you, you, that shading or, or uh, competition will slow them down. That's, that's a good thing, but it just means you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get, if you're trying to get wood out of spruce, uh, you're gonna be waiting a while. Um, resistant seedlings may be available, although I haven't heard much about, about how that's worked out um, as far as, as finding those. Um, and I think this is my last, slides so just really quick in the last minute here uh doug for twig we another weevil like this uh white pine weevil or spruce i should mention the name on this thing is kind of goofy because uh on the east coast it's really an issue in white pine and so that's kind of what it's officially named after it used to be called spruce weevil on the west coast um so anyway that's why white pine and a spruce um, so this one, Doug fir, thankfully named Doug fir twig weevil, mainly in Doug fir and true firs like grand fir. So we're talking like young uh, seedling sapling size trees. Uh, it kills twigs and, and the leaders in a very similar way to the other one in spruce uh, might be even cuter adults. Um, 
but if you have drought uh, right after planting or poor planting, so kind of uh, sticking uh, plugs or roots of trees planted poorly, um, bending the root or j-rooting it uh, can kind of cause these chronic problems over the long term. And, and these beetles really like going after the, the more stressed trees. So that's something to watch out for. Uh, with drought, another agent that kind of follows along. Okay, so um, here for questions. Perfect. Thanks, Glenn. Um, we got yep. a handful of questions in the chat, um, and feel free to continue to type those away for those that are going to be sticking around. We'll hang out until they're all answered, uh, or one, whichever comes soon. Um, so the first question is from Janine. She asks, uh, do wood borers occupy residential wood piles as well, or do they only live in the forest? Yes, they would be in residential wood piles for sure. Okay. Uh, let's see, a couple from Julian there. Jeff I mean, the, has... the, the one thing, sorry, I'll, I just should add to the, the wood pile yeah. uh, thing is, is like, I mentioned this with bark beetles that if the wood, get split uh, and the bark starts to kind of dry out, a lot of these things won't survive uh, in that condition. They usually need like a longer piece with intact bark. Mm, okay. Um, John asks if you, well, he has a comment. So I hope you have some time to tell us a little bit about carpenter ants. Do you have any yeah. thoughts on them from a forest perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, usually end up leaving out carpenter ants and termites um, because they're not like, you know, forestry pests, but they are an issue, especially with, um, you know, homeowners and people mm -hmm. living on the woodlot when you have carpenter ants and termites in your trees, um, a live tree, it's, it's a little uh, concerning because that usually indicates there's a hazard there. Um, so the, the termites and the carpenter ants, they're only getting in parts of the tree that are completely dead. So they're not the initial wave like the bark beetles and wood borers that are sort of happily fighting off the pitch response of a tree. Um, the carpenter ants and termites are waiting, you know, until things are fully dead and dry. Uh, and so what could happen, so the, the carpenter ants, they're making nests in dead wood. So they make these, this system of tunnels, essentially like the city of ants inside a tree. And that's where they're laying their eggs and raising their young. They feed on other things, but just live in the tree. The termites are feeding on the actual wood of the tree. And, and so their, their droppings or frass are like a different consistency. So with termites, they tend to be more like pellets. Um, if you look at it magnified in the carpenter ants, it's more like shavings and powder. Um, and what where I encounter this most with landowners is, again, a, a green tree, there's a big hole in the side of it and ants or termites are coming out of this tree. So they're not killing the tree, but the tree has heart rot uh, or a wound, an old wound that's, that's dead. Uh, the tree may have walled that wound off uh, and it's it's keeping the ants or termites from going any further. Uh, but that just tells you if they're living in your tree, even if that tree's alive and well, uh, it's got some defect in there, and and it's more than likely a hazard to falling. Perfect. And I accidentally exited out of the chat box. There. Get back. Um, okay, so a question from Tamara. It seems most of these borers and beetles are specific to a particular tree host. Are there any that will cross over from deciduous to conifer? Uh, yeah, I think there are a few that, that would do that, but I honestly haven't thought about that too much. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say a few, but I'm going to say for the most part, uh, there it's going to be conifers versus hardwoods like if you have a species that likes conifers it's it might be in both pine and fir and larch uh, they're pretty general in that sense uh, but 
those wouldn't usually cross over into hardwoods, but you have a whole host of uh, other wood borers uh, in the hardwoods for different species that I didn't really get into. So Alan has a question about uh, flat-headed borers. He says, I have flat-headed borers in 10-year-old ornamental maples and oaks. It's more of a landscape situation. Mm -hmm. um, the product merit, imidacloprid, I have a hard mm -hmm. time pronouncing that one, is registered as a root-drenching material systemic to control flatheads. Uh, mm -hmm. The product's been labeled for many years. Considering possible insect resistance, do you know if imidacloprid is still an effective pesticide on flatheads? Um, I'm, I'm not really an expert on controlling flat-headed fur borer, or not fur borer, just flat-headed borers, right. forget fur in this case, um, with insecticides. I, I know quite a bit more about controlling bark beetles, and, and I do know that imidacloprid is effective uh, against bark beetles. There are better products though, um, like a emamectin benzoate, which is a newer uh, product. Um, you know, it's called, it's sold by like image, Imaget. Uh, yeah. And it's another systemic. Um, my concern with the pesticides, yes, insect resistance can be an issue. Um, but the population has to be exposed to the insecticide like over and over and over. And so I think that tends to be like more of an issue with farming um, and, you know, where you have multiple generations of like aphids or something where they can quickly develop that resistance. Uh, whereas the wood borers are super long lived. Um, so that, that may not be an issue. Um, what might be an issue is whatever is attracting them to your trees, like if the oaks and maples were, were super, super healthy and vigorous, uh, the, these wood borers wouldn't be there. They're there because there's something stressing those trees probably. I mean, I don't know what, but that would be my guess is, uh, you know, maybe offsite planting or they're uh, drought stressed. I mean, it could be any, any number of things. And so in addition, to the insecticide, uh, which is totally reasonable for ornamental protecting those things. In addition to that, just think about what other factors might be uh, stressing those trees. Yeah. And, you know, in the landscape setting like that, probably a really good question for an arborist, too. Yeah. Uh, and it's yeah. also uh, super important to get them identified. Mm -hmm. um, if you can get any adults or if you have like a one of the trees that's completely dead or a large branch that's dead um what i do is you cut sections of a branch or a tree with intact bark and put it in a garbage can um and eventually you might get some adult beetles coming out of there and those are actually easy to identify um and and there's a lot of information out there on some of these that are real pests of hardwoods uh, you might be able to find some good, good literature uh, about how to manage that particular one. All right. Um, so someone also asked, an arborist said bark beetles can enter through woodpecker holes. Mm. Uh, is this true or false? Um, I'm going to go with possible, sure, <laughs> but <laughs> but really unlikely. Um, I mean, I think they might be attracted to a tree with woodpecker activity because I know when you wound a tree, uh, it creates these smells, right? The, the volatiles and and insects will come to that area, but the bark beetles are not, they're not going to all enter through this one hole. They're going to, you know, kind of mass attack the tree and create their own holes all over the place. Um, and the bark beetles are only interested in the uh, the inner bark. Uh, between the sapwood and the bark, that layer, and the woodpeckers tend to go go past that. Except for the sapsuckers, don't go past that. But yeah, I don't, I don't see that as an issue. All right. Well, CJ um, commented that she really appreciates your clear and easy to understand uh, descriptions. 
So well, thank, thank you, you for that. I'd like um, to hear it. I might talk too fast, but <laughs> no, you did great. Okay. Uh, TJ, she also asked, uh, he uh, will sap sucker holes kill or only stress trees? Well, I'm going to go with most of the time they're stressing. Yeah. Um, and it depends on the number of holes and how close they are. Uh, so if you know you just have a few holes, the tree doesn't care. Um, but you get to the point where I had a willow tree on my property that was, you know, the main stem was probably eight inches in diameter. And the sap sucker had gotten so bad that the bark had just was falling off and the tree died. So once those holes get so close together and they start to coalesce, and then you start to just get this big opening, uh, then the bark starts drying out. That's that's bad news. All right. You can, well, you can scare them off apparently with different devices, and um, there's WSU has some pamphlets on that. Yeah, and I can, I think I have a copy of that I can give to people. Um, I've not heard much success with the scare tactic. Yeah, yeah, or you know, there's like different. Yeah, well, I won't go into it, but I, I think the woodpeckers are they're very tenacious. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so we have a handful of questions from folks um, that we covered in, in really great detail yesterday. Um, and so I'm going to plug in the link to the website that's hosting all the recordings. And yesterday's recording is up there. Um, one question that I think maybe we didn't touch on yesterday was from Steve, and actually this maybe would have been more for the first day, but um, does female dug for bark beetle, does the female dug for bark beetle lay fertilized eggs, or does she lay eggs that need fertilization by a male, uh, who has also made his way through the bark in the same area? The, the second one. So okay. the, the way it usually works with that species is the female initiates the attack on the tree uh, drilling through the bark and then if she's successful reaching the phloem layer uh, at that point then she attracts a male using a sex attractant pheromone and and they mate right there the male enters the tree with her and they mate and in, inside the tree um, and yeah then the female lays fertilized eggs uh, and sometimes they re-emerge so, you know, definitely the males will come back out and try to find another tree with a mate and, uh, but the females might go and lay a second uh, clutch of eggs uh, in a different tree. And then there's some pretty, um, not to go into weird details, but there's some pretty cool videos about uh, research being done with sound and bark beetles as a, as a deterrent. So bark beetles don't, you know, they really don't like the chewing sounds of their neighbors. Right. Um, and so that's how they avoid each other in the tunnels. You know, it's perfectly, completely dark in there, right? So if you're in a tunnel and you don't want to run into your neighbor, you listen to them and that's how you avoid them. Well, they did these experiments where they played different sounds, you know, like heavy metal music and stuff and piped it inside the tree. Uh, and, the, and the bark beetles basically freak out they either stop feeding or they just panic and and there's some videos of uh like a female trying to escape the tunnel and literally chewing right through a male to get out oh my gosh yeah it's pretty awful but speaking of heavy metal <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know someday in the future um you know you might be able to hook up speakers to a yard tree or something like that yeah, you, you heard it here, folks. Metallica yeah. will save you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> by the way, I want to say it was a real missed opportunity to not call this bugs for lunch. I I know. I yeah, thought of that today, today while I was making these <laughs> slides earlier. Um, so I think that's all the questions we have. Uma and Rhonda, I just I um I just put that link into yesterday's recording. I see your questions and they're very good questions, but uh those the recording from yesterday will be able to give you more context uh, and pointed answers to both your questions um, we, from what we discussed yesterday. So uh, please make sure you go and, and watch that. Um, otherwise, we will call it a day here uh, and pick up tomorrow again at noon. And uh, big thanks to you, Glenn. Really appreciate this. Um, yeah, happy to do it. I was really glad to 
get to talk about wood borers in such detail and never get to. Yeah, bark beetles kind of steal the show. <laughs> That's right. Okay. All right. Well, everybody have a great day and we will see you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks.